It will tell you about the tiny, 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 little, little, little quantum, quantum particles and how crazy, crazy, crazy the quantum, quantum world is. He will tell you if it is really true that quantum mechanics can explain telekinesis, mind over matter, telepathy, consciousness, good vibrations, bad vibrations, and even what your mother had for breakfast. More important of all, he will tell what quantum mechanics is and what it is not. Ladies and gentlemen, after the words of Charles Marcus, we will have Christian Bosquets, who has been called Wild Man of the Danish Chess Court of Arms and the Trent in Danish Chess. Christian Osgood has gathered a special constellation for this evening science and cocktails, composed of Dan Peter Sundland, Ned Berg, Jimmy Newborn, and Christian Osgood. End of transmission. about quantum mechanics. And those of you who have a good feeling about your, I don't know, quantum mechanics class when you were in college, um, or the reading informally that you've done, um, you'll, uh, I hope you'll find it familiar, if not understandable. That's one of the keys of physical sciences research is to learn, ultimately, to confuse the two, to uh, become exposed enough to ideas that you can't distinguish whether or not they're understandable or just familiar. And that, happens, uh, that happens to all of us. The picture in the background is the cover of a recent issue. This is February 2014 from Time Magazine um, that, uh, I think it's a little bit loud, yeah, that uh, had this kind of uh, you know, provocative title on the front of the magazine. Uh, it promises, it, it doesn't say what it is, it promises to solve some of humanity's most complex problems. It's backed by Jeff Bezos, NASA, and the CIA. Each one costs $10 million and operates at 459 degrees below zero, and nobody knows exactly how it works. The infinity machine. Now, you know, it's usual for a scientist to say, this is all bullshit. This is true. But actually, nobody does know how it works. It's true, and there is a machine, and it does cost $10 million. So those, those words are true. And um, what this lecture is about is about trying to get from some starting point to trying to understand what is this thing in this world that we've built a machine, but nobody knows how it works. It's a strange situation. So I want to start with something that we're all familiar with and work our way toward the unfamiliar. And I want to do it in a way where everybody feels comfortable stopping me and saying, ah, you just, you just went too fast. I was familiar with what you just said before, but now you lost me. I'm not familiar. So maybe I can even, the people who have sacrificed chairs to, you know, you folks exactly right here. Will you take the responsibility of, for the rest of you who I might not see their arms, if I say something that, like, it was okay a minute ago, but now it's not okay anymore, you say, it's not okay. Because it's probably the case that many people, because I've gone too fast, because I've learned myself to, you know, 
exchange understanding with familiarity. So these are water waves, and it's a pretty picture, and the water waves illustrate um, that if you take two sources of water, like you just you know bonk your fingers down in, into a puddle of water, that um, it'll produce waves far away, but the waves will have a certain pattern because you put two fingers down in the water. And I think that many of you solved this elementary problem, the, the math of the problem is pretty straightforward, that you can find places like here where there's no water wave, the wave has um, canceled itself out, the one which was high uh, added up with the one that was low and it kind of added up to zero, whereas the ones in this, in this big area you can see that they're like doubly bright, they're, they're high waves and low waves and high waves and low waves, and it just comes from adding up the two sources of the waves that maybe here, look, they're exactly out of phase, so the high one and the low one are right on top of each other, so the high one and the low one add up to zero, so this would be a place where there'd be no wave at all. And then if you went to a place where the two were coming in like this together, it would be doubly high. And then you can, you know, make it uh, into a math problem if you want to, but don't do it. The point, is to, the point is to see that there are places where there's high amplitude and places where there's low amplitude of these waves that are adding up. Now what's interesting is all kinds of things act like this, act like waves. Light does it. And so here's an example of two light waves that have, um, that have impinged. I should go back as you can, so you can see the pretty picture first. Here's two light waves that have come. And to get them lined up so that the first blobs are lined up together and they're not shifted in some way, um, a, a common way to do it is to take one light coming in and put two little slits in the pattern and then, and then they both start off together because they came from the same light and they go out in these patterns and the same thing happens. There's a place where they add up to nothing in the middle where the high of one and the low of the other added up to nothing. And then there's other places where the high of one and the low of the other were on top of each other and they made a doubly bright wave. And that's all I want you to see now is that you can imagine that if you had two sources of light that were from this kind of a situation, that what waves do is they can add and subtract from each other. And it, I want to contrast it with other things in your life, like if you're riding your bike across an intersection and there's another bike there, you don't have the situation then in which, you know, you know good thing your, your minimum was right next to his positive, so you went through each other and nothing happened. It doesn't happen with things like people and bicycles and, you know, ping pong balls and physical objects that have a certain location. They don't do that. So there's this property of waves that are familiar. It's not, a, it's not an abstract idea. It's, it's everything you, every time you splash in the water, you see these kinds of waves, and they do that thing, which we'll call interference. Now, where life gets interesting is if I take light and I let it come very, very faintly through, like I just turn the amplitude of the light down, to nearly nothing. What I'll see on the pattern, and this is from an experiment, but it's captured on a, on a background screen where the light went through, is that you see the individual, okay, I'm introducing a new term now, introducing uh, the term photons, the individual particles of light that land on the screen that make a little blip. And when I let the thing go, and I let it accumulate, you see it makes a pattern. And the pattern on the screen has these same stripes that the light came from the two slits. There's places where it adds up to nothing, and the places where it doubles, and then it adds up to nothing, and then it doubles, etc. And now it's a little bit hard to think about. I have to say it's very hard to think about this. In fact, if you're going to make any noise in the front about my saying something that doesn't make any sense, it's going to be now. <laughs> this is it. This, this slide is all of quantum mechanics. Almost, there's a couple more things, but this is, <laughs> this is basically it. So let me say what the problem is. The problem is, for the light to act like a wave coming from a single source, it needed to be lined up, and then from these two sources, like where I was splashing, it needed to add up to either a double or a nothing. We did that already. So it had to have come from this place and that place and added up to either a double or nothing. Now, something fun is happening now, which is 
Like, let's take that one, for instance. That one's not able to go on both sides at the same time. It's over there. So it has to somehow get to the screen knowing precisely about the distance. Because if you do the math, you have to know how far these are apart and how far this distance is to get how far apart the stripes are. So this, this guy had to have been over here also. So when I tell the story of the particle was over here, this is just a drawing, and it's a bad drawing. It's a deceptive drawing. Because if I say that the only way I can get a null spot, like this spot right here in the middle where they don't go, is if the one that starts from here and the one that starts from here add up to nothing, i got to ask you, like, what about this guy? I mean, he's over here now. Was he over there also? Now it should be totally unbelievable, like I'm trying to trick you. Like I'm telling you something that's manifestly untrue, only it seems like that's what happens when you do the experiments. And I have to say, that is what the founding fathers in this city experienced 100 years ago was that there were experiments that would be done that Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Dirac and the great heroes of our field thought, this doesn't make any sense at all. How do I tell a story in which particles, maybe in this case it's electrons, doing the exact same thing. The electrons impinge upon the screen and that electron lands right there on the screen, that one, right there on the screen, and it makes a bright spot on the screen. It is, at that moment, there. But you see that it makes a bright, dark, bright, dark pattern, which means that earlier, it must have been in both parts of the interference experiment at the same time. Well, all you can do is say, I can make up math to explain that but I don't really have any understanding of it. It just seems like it's just wrong. Because if you think about the implications of that, if you think about the fact that what we can say is that the light coming out of this light and coming to your eye and registering on your retina, just like making the spot there, wasn't anywhere until it landed on your retina. It didn't have a location. You gave it a location. It wasn't someplace like they taught you in school, on its way to your eye. A good thing your eye was there, and your eye, and your eye caught it. <laughs> Which is, you know, it sounds silly, but that's actually what, you know, what everybody said, right? You'd say, you know, you'd see these old pictures from the ancients about light coming out of your eyes. And they say, oh, no, that's not how it works. The light goes into your eyes. The light comes from the light bulb and goes into your eyes. And you never thought, the light that's coming into my eyes didn't have a location until I gave it one with my eye. But there's no other way to explain this story. In a hundred years of quantum mechanics, we have no other way of explaining the story, except to say that by measuring something, you give it a reality. Okay, you can imagine how weird the world's going to get now. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, this, this is electron waves. These are manifestly particles. These are the things that are in atoms. These are the things that flow through the wire, but they can be made to be in different places at the same time and have this interference experiment. And what's great is the dis discovery of this in the 1920s was itself an accident. If you read the paper, and this is the... This is the Nobel Prize winning paper that announced that electrons can show an interference pattern just like water waves. Here's how the paper begins. It's called diffraction, which is this adding up of waves. Diffraction of electrons by a crystal of nickel. And I love the introduction to this paper. Imagine we wrote scientific papers like this now. The investigation report in this paper was begun as the result of an accident which occurred in the laboratory. <laughs> scientists in the audience, next time you submit to your advisor a paper, start it off like this, and then to, you know, tell them you plan on winning a Nobel Prize for this paper. 
Uh, at that time, we were continuing an investigation, first reported in 1921, this is now 1927, uh, of the distribution and angles of electrons scattered by a target of ordinary nickel. During the course of this work, a liquid air bottle exploded at a time when the target was at high temp. This is a Nobel Prize winning paper. <laughs> at a time when the target was at high temperature, the experimental tube was broken and the target heavily oxidized by the inrushing air. The oxide was eventually reduced and a layer of target material uh, removed by vaporization, but only after prolonged heating at various high temperatures in hydrogen and in vacuum. When the experiments were continued, it was found that the distribution and angles of the scattered electrons had been completely changed. That is, and here's figure one of the paper. <laughs> the scattering curves from the nickel before and after crystal growth had occurred. That is, before the gas cylinder blew up. And it looked like this before and afterwards it had all of these maxima and minima and maxima and minima as if the electrons had used the crystal in nickel as the spots off of which it would reflect and make this pattern. Accidental discovery, utterly puzzling. It also tells you something about data, that is, you, it, it has to be the experimental art to see that in going from something that looks like this to going to something that looks like this, you not only have changed the world, but you've changed philosophy. That's kind of nice. It makes it nice to be an experimentalist and have the possibility of having data that goes from this to this change philosophy. So what I do for a living is I make electronics, but not the kinds that are in, you know, cell phones or radios or anything like that. I make electronics that are sufficiently small that the physics of this interference effect that makes all of the electrons inside of it be in multiple places at the same time shows up inside of these chips that we make. And so I'm going to use the example of my own experimental research as the story of how to go from this funny fact about our eye gives the photon its reality to the cover of that Time Magazine article. So here are the chips. Here's it held in a pair of fingers and connected inside of something that's a commercial chip socket that goes inside of a modern piece of electronics. And you can see little wires that connect this object. And here's this thing. You can see I would be about holding it in my hand about like that. And here's this chip on the inside. And we use techniques in the laboratory uh, called uh, photolithography and electron beam lithography and all kinds of fancy techniques with large tools that let us place metal on the surface of a semiconductor. A semiconductor is something that will change it, how well it conducts electricity when you put a voltage on it. So down at the vanishing point of this thing, and I keep having to change tools because first of all, a light microscope and then a light microscope runs out of light and then it runs out of everything. So you have to keep changing tools to look at this thing. But it keeps vanishing all the way down into the middle of this thing on the size scale of a, of a micron or a half a micron, a little object that sits in the middle that we can play with electrically. And you see that all of these lines that form this object were all the ones that went all the way out to the outside and were connected by wires that we can then turn the knobs on. And they go all the way down to something. Now, a, a red blood cell is about eight microns in diameter. So we're fabricating little electrical circuits which would you know, easily fit on the surface of a red blood cell. But they're all connected to wires that just go to voltmeters on the outside and we can control them. So it's almost like we're making artificial atoms that are not much bigger than that size that we can play with these devices. And while these are rather expensive tools, I have to say that they're not particularly hard to work. You can just draw a pattern using a you know, CAD program that shows you where to put the lines and the tools make these devices. And you have to cool the system down near absolute zero, so you have to buy that machine too. But you know, if you throw enough money at these things, then you get all the tools in and you can do these experiments. And they're not, they're not the kind of thing that are um, so esoteric that, that they're hard to picture. But when you make these devices, now you can make something that's a little bit like that two-slit interference experiment that I showed you before. For instance, imagine that I had an electrical circuit where I could make uh, electricity flow from the top of the circuit down to the bottom of the circuit. And I could say, well, now electricity that flows this way, well, I, have, I guess I have to say it flows that way. 
uh, and it flows this way at the same time. But if I think of it made out of individual electrons, then I have to say, well, I guess the electron went this way and it went that way at the same time. Okay, not so bad. And here's the experimental evidence, which is if I put on a magnetic field that goes through this hole in the middle, I can make an interference pattern, just like the interference pattern that shows up on the wall, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, except in this case, the bright, dark, bright, dark is controlled by magnetic field, and the bright, dark, bright, dark is how well it conducts electricity. And that interference pattern is the same interference pattern as the bright, dark, bright, dark on the walls that shows that the electricity must have gone both ways at the same time. Or, it wasn't anywhere until it was measured. Because I only gave it two choices. But had there been a third, that would have also participated in the interference. In fact, it would have gone anywhere you allowed it until you told it, where are you? And then like the little black dot, it would answer the question, I'm right here. You say, wait a minute, I thought you were over there too. No, no, I was never over there. <laughs> There was a chance that I was over there, but it turns out I wasn't. So when we talk about the waves in quantum mechanics that interfere, you laugh, but that's what the wave is. The wave is a wave of the odds that the particle was there. Those waves of probability, not the probability of something that's kind of everywhere at the same time, but the probability that if I measure it, it will be right there and not over there, moves as a wave. That wave is called the wave function. And it's the wave of the probability of it being in only one location when you measure it there. I, I hope it's getting strange. I mean, I hope that this is starting to bother me a little bit. Like, they pay this guy? <laughs> Because he's so here. Now, it gets even weirder when there's, when there's electrons compared to light. Because electrons carry charge. And charge other and nothing happens. It doesn't happen with things like people and bicycles and you know, ping pong balls and physical objects that have a certain location. They don't do that. So there's this property of waves that are familiar. It's not, a, it's not an abstract idea. It's, it's Everything you, every time you splash in the water, you see these kinds of waves, and they do that thing, which we'll call interference. Now, where life gets interesting is if I take light and I let it come very, very faintly through, like I just turn the amplitude of the light down to nearly nothing. What I'll see on the pattern, and this is from an experiment, but it's captured on a, on a background screen where the light went through, is that you see the individual, okay, I'm introducing a new term now, introducing uh, the term photons, the individual particles of light that land on the screen that make a little blip. And when I let the thing go, and I let it accumulate, you see it makes a pattern. And the pattern on the screen has these same stripes that the light came from the two slits. There's places where it adds up to nothing, in the places where it doubles, and then it adds up to nothing, and then it doubles, etc. And now it's a little bit hard to think about. I have to say it's very hard to think about this. In fact, if you're going to make any noise in the front about my saying something that doesn't make any sense, it's going to be now. <laughs> this is it. This, this slide is all of quantum mechanics. Almost. But this is, this is basically it. So let me say what the problem is. The problem is, for the light to act like a wave coming from a single source, it needed to be lined up, and then from these two sources, like where I was splashing, it needed to add up to either a double or a nothing. Okay, we did that already. So it had to have come from this place and that place, and add it up to either a double or nothing. Now, something fun is happening now. Which is, like let's take that one for instance. That one's not able to go on both sides at the same time, it's over there. So it has to somehow get to the screen knowing precisely about the distance, because if you do the math, you have to know how far these are apart and how far this distance is to get how far apart the stripes are. So this, this guy 
had to have been over here also. So when I tell the story of the particle was over here, this is just a drawing, and it's a bad drawing. It's a deceptive drawing. Because if I say that the only way I can get a null spot, like this spot right here in the middle where they don't go, is if the one that starts from here and the one that starts from here add up to nothing, i got to ask you, like, what about this guy? I mean, he's over here now. Was he over there also? Now it should be totally unbelievable, like I'm trying to trick you. Like I'm telling you something that's manifestly untrue, only it seems like that's what happens when you do the experiments. And I have to say, that is what the founding fathers in this city experienced 100 years ago, was that there were experiments that would be done that Bohr and Heisenberg and Schrodinger and Dirac and the great heroes of our field thought, this doesn't make any sense at all. How do I tell a story in which particles, maybe in this case it's electrons, doing the exact same thing? The electrons impinge upon the screen, and that electron lands right there on the screen, that one, right there on the screen, and it makes a bright spot on the screen. It is, at that moment, there. But you see that it makes a bright, dark, bright, dark pattern, which means that earlier, it must have been in both parts of the interference experiment at the same time. Well, all you can do is say, I can make up math to explain that. But I don't really have any understanding of it. It just seems like it's just wrong. Because if you think about the implications of that, if you think about the fact that what we can say is that the light coming out of this light and coming to your eye and registering on your retina, just like making the spot there, wasn't anywhere until it landed on your retina. It didn't have a location. You gave it a location. It wasn't someplace like they taught you in school, on its way to your eye. A good thing your eye was there, and your eye, and your eye caught it. <laughs> Which is, you know, it sounds silly, but that's actually what, you know, what everybody said, right? You'd say, you know, you'd see these old pictures from the ancients about light coming out of your eyes. And they say, oh, no, that's not how it works. The light goes into your eyes. The light comes from the light bulb and goes into your eyes. And you never thought, the light that's coming into my eyes didn't have a location until I gave it one with my eye. But there's no other way to explain this story. In a hundred years of quantum mechanics, we have no other way of explaining the story, except to say that by measuring something, you give it a reality. Okay, you can imagine how weird the world's gonna get now. <laughs> you know, it's interesting, this, this is electron waves. These are manifestly particles. These are the things that are in atoms, these are the things that flow through the wire, but they can be made to be in different places at the same time and have this interference experiment. And what's great is, the dis discovery of this in the 1920s was itself an accident. If you read the paper, and this is the, this is the Nobel Prize winning paper that announced that electrons can show an interference pattern just like water waves. Here's how the paper begins. It's called diffraction, which is this adding up of waves. Diffraction of electrons by a crystal of nickel. And I love the introduction to this paper. Imagine we wrote scientific papers like this now. The investigation report in this paper was begun as the result of an accident which occurred in the laboratory. <laughs> I mean, those of you who are scientists in the audience, next time you submit to your advisor a paper, start it off like this, and then to, you know, tell them that you plan on winning a Nobel Prize for this paper. Uh, at that time, we were continuing an investigation, first reported in 1921, this is now 1927, uh, of the distribution and angles of electrons scattered by a target of ordinary nickel. 
During the course of this work, a liquid air bottle exploded at a time when the target was at high temperature. This is a Nobel Prize winning paper. <laughs> at a time when the target was at high temperature, the experimental tube was broken and the target heavily oxidized by the inrushing air. The oxide was eventually reduced and a layer of target material uh, removed by vaporization, but only after prolonged heating at various high temperatures in hydrogen and in vacuum. When the experiments were continued, it was found that the distribution and angles of the scattered electrons had been completely changed. That is, and here's figure one of the paper. <laughs> the scattering curves from the nickel before and after crystal growth had occurred. That is, before the gas cylinder blew up. And it looked like this before and afterwards it had all of these maxima and minima and maxima and minima as if the electrons had used the crystal in nickel as the spots off of which it would reflect and make this pattern. Accidental discovery, utterly puzzling. It also tells you something about data, that is, you, it, it has to be the experimental art to see that in going from something that looks like this to going to something that looks like this, you not only have changed the world, but you've changed philosophy. That's kind of nice. It makes it nice to be an experimentalist and have the possibility of having data that goes from this to this change philosophy. So what I do for a living is I make electronics, but not the kinds that are in, you know, cell phones or radios or anything like that. I make electronics that are sufficiently small that the physics of this interference effect that makes all of the electrons inside of it be in multiple places at the same time shows up inside of these chips that we make. And so I'm going to use the example of my own experimental research as the story of how to go from this funny fact about our eye gives the photon its reality to the cover of that Time Magazine article. So here are the chips. Here's it held in a pair of fingers and connected inside of something that's a commercial chip socket that goes inside of a modern piece of electronics. And you can see little wires that connect this object. And here's this thing. You can see I would be about holding it in my hand about like that. And here's this chip on the inside. And we use techniques in the laboratory uh, called uh, photolithography and electron beam lithography and all kinds of fancy techniques with large tools that let us place metal on the surface of a semiconductor. A semiconductor is something that will change it, how well it conducts electricity when you put a voltage on it. So down at the vanishing point of this thing, and I keep having to change tools because first of all, a light microscope and then a light microscope runs out of light and then it runs out of everything. And so you have to keep changing tools to look at this thing. But it keeps vanishing all the way down into the middle of this thing on the size scale of a, of a micron or a half a micron, a little object that sits in the middle that we can play with electrically. And you see that all of these lines that form this object were all the ones that went all the way out to the outside and were connected by wires that we can then turn the knobs on. And they go all the way down to something. Now, a, a red blood cell is about eight microns in diameter. So we're fabricating little electrical circuits which would you know, easily fit on the surface of a red blood cell. But they're all connected to wires that just go to voltmeters on the outside and we can control them. So it's almost like we're making artificial atoms that are not much bigger than that size that we can play with these devices. And while these are rather expensive tools, I have to say that they're not particularly hard to work. You can just draw a pattern using a you know, CAD program that shows you where to put the lines and the tools make these devices. And you have to cool the system down near absolute zero, so you have to buy that machine too. But you know, if you throw enough money at these things, then you get all the tools in and you can do these experiments. And they're not, they're not the kind of thing that are um, so esoteric that, that they're hard to picture. But when you make these devices, now you can make something that's a little bit like that two-slit interference experiment that I showed you before. For instance, imagine that I had an electrical circuit where I could make uh, electricity flow from the top of the circuit down to the bottom of the circuit. And I could say, well, now electricity that flows this way, well, I, have, I guess I have to say it flows that way uh, and it flows this way at the same time. But if I think of it made out of individual electrons, then I have to say, well, I guess the electron went this way and it went that way at the same time. 
Okay, not so bad. And here's the experimental evidence, which is if I put on a map that goes through this hole in the middle, I can make an interference pattern, just like the interference pattern that shows up on the wall, bright, dark, bright, dark, bright, dark, except in this case, the bright, dark, bright, dark is controlled by magnetic field, and the bright, dark, bright, dark is how well it conducts electricity. And that interference pattern is the same interference pattern as the bright, dark, bright, dark on the walls that shows that the electricity must have gone both ways at the same time. Or, it wasn't anywhere until it was measured. Because I only gave it two choices. But had there been a third, that would have also participated in the interference. In fact, it would have gone anywhere you allowed it until you told it, where are you? And then like the little black dot, it would answer the question, I'm right here. You say, wait a minute, I thought you were over there too. No, no, I was never over there. <laughs> there was a chance that I was over there. But it turns out I wasn't. So when we talk about the waves in quantum mechanics that interfere, you laugh, but that's what the wave is. The wave is a wave of the odds that the particle was there. Those waves of probability, not the probability of something that's kind of everywhere at the same time, but the probability that if I measure, it will be right there and not over there, moves as a wave. That wave is called the wave function. And it's the wave of the probability of it being in only one location when you measure it there. I, I hope it's getting strange. I mean, I hope that this is starting to bother me a little bit. Like, they pay this guy? <laughs> because, he, so here, now, it gets even weirder when there's, when there's electrons compared to light. Because electrons carry charge. And charge carry charge. For instance, that I said, well, this electron is both on this side and both on that side. But, let's say I hooked it up to a transistor such that if it was on this side, it would flip the switch up. And if it was on that side, it would flip the switch down. Then I would have to say, ah, I see. The electron is both places at the same time. It's both here and the switch is up. And it's there and the switch is down. Because they're correlated with each other. You always get right, up, left, down. Okay, now that's going to be funny. Because what if this switch let electricity flow into some other thing that was a branched thing? But this one didn't because the switch is down. Then you can see that other electricity is flowing and not flowing at the same time. And depending on whether I measure it, it either is or isn't letting electricity go on to something else, which itself can then turn on and not turn on something at the same time, depending on whether I measure the first one to be on the left or on the right. So I measure one thing, and it gives me an answer. Remember, it was a probability. It says, no, no, I was here the whole time. And all of a sudden, the switch says, and I was down the whole time. Now, you know about this cat, probably. And it was, you know, the point of the cat, which was, again, in the mid-1920s, was that Schrodinger had really just had enough. And he said, now I know that I and you and cats are made out of atoms. And I know that that electron in the atom necessarily isn't anywhere. So I could make a cat, which, for instance, I'll just read directly from, from the uh, Schrodinger's paper. Uh, it said, one can even set up quite ridiculous cases. A cat is penned up in a steel chamber along with a Geiger counter and a tiny bit of radioactive substance. There's the radioactive substance. There's the, well, here, we're going to get to that part. Perhaps uh, one of the atoms decays. One atom, one atom decays. Maybe or maybe not. If it happens, the counter tube discharges and through the relay releases a hammer which shatters the flask of hydrocyanic acid this thing down here. The wave function of the entire system would be expressed by having it in both the living and the dead cat, pardon the expression from the original paper, mixed in equal parts. That is like the light switch, which was up or down, depending on whether the thing went on the left. If the atom decays, the cat is dead. If the atom doesn't decay, the cat is alive. So you say, what's the situation with the cat? And Schrodinger was saying, and please don't tell me 
that in, not until I look in the box do I kill the cat or not kill the cat. I mean, surely the cat knows what state it's in. The cat must know whether it's alive or dead, say, for instance. But where is that in quantum mechanics? Where is our theory of which of the two answers is the one that's realized? Because the photon needed your eye to find its location. So the cat needs to know whether the atom came out or not in order to be alive or dead. But someone has to measure the whole system. And until you measure it, maybe it is alive or dead. Now, I think we all have intuitions about life. And so maybe we can leave the cat for just a second. But imagine I do something which is maybe not so different, but I take a, a chip like the one in, in your phone with a billion different transistors on it. And I say, okay, the transistor like this one is on. And it turns on the electricity. Well, I'm sorry, it has to be on and off at the same time. Okay, so this one's on and off, and it lets electricity flow, which determines whether or not that one turns on and off at the same time. But that lets electricity flow over here, which turns on that one, which is then either on or off, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for all billion of them. And everybody is on and off at the same time, depending on whether or not the ones that lead to it are on or off at the same time. And then I measure this one, and it suddenly determines that one, which suddenly determines whether these other ones are. And the whole system then collapses into either a live chip or a dead chip, depending on what I've done. So the difference between the cat and the chip is that in order to do these experiments, you can't measure the system. And one of the things that measures the system besides people is temperature. So if the system is hot, then all the vibrations from the side of the hot chamber will tell whether or not the cat is leaning against it or not leaning against it, whether it's collapsed on the side. And it will know. So you have to operate the system at near absolute zero. But of course, if you put a cat near absolute zero, then you're going to know the answer to the question. <laughs> and so instead, you can ask, what if I did it with something which doesn't need to be at room temperature, doesn't need to be in the air, just works just fine. And in fact, it may not be obvious to you. But these things do work just fine all the way down to absolute zero, near absolute zero, as near as we can get in the laboratory, these transistors continue to work. So now we can create something very interesting. Indeed, I can say, we can create something that's never existed before. We can create something in which all of these quantum mechanical correlations between being in multiple states at the same time, simultaneously, each influencing each other, can exist. It's all consistent with the laws of physics. Only no one's ever made one before. And no one knows what will happen. I have to introduce one other aspect of quantum mechanics, which is kind of not obvious. It's another attribute of these individual particles. They carry around one other piece of information with them besides their location and if they're an electron charge. And they also have mass, so they bump into things. They have one other attribute, which is their spinning. So like this top, they carry angular momentum. So they're kind of spinning on their axis, and the angular momentum points in whichever direction that they're spinning. And also in the 1920s, there was a miraculous discovery by uh, this guy. This is uh, Otto Stern and his partner, Gerlach. Sorry, I'm standing in front of the screen. Stern and Gerlach discovered something interesting, which was that if they took a series of atoms and shined them through a slit, they would find that it came out in one of two populations. Again, imagine having data that looked like that, changing philosophy. But they knew what they had. They wrote a letter to Professor Bohr uh, on Stockholm's Gale in Copenhagen. And they said, dear Professor Bohr, uh, attached is the experimental proof of direction quantization. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. We congratulate you on the confirmation of your theory. There it is, right there, a little smiling mouth on its side, confirming the theory. What they had done was, they had built a magnet that had a gradient of the magnetic field, so it was stronger on one side than it was on the other. And when they put, in this case, they used silver atoms, but they put particles that went through, and then something interesting happened. 
If those things behave like little spinning objects, and they put it through a gradient, if it's spinning up, it would go up. If it's pointing down, it would go down. If it's pointing sideways, it wouldn't go anywhere. So classically, you'd expect this big blob to come out. These are the guys that would be sideways, these were the guys that would be up, and these were the guys that would be down. And what Stern and Gerlach found was it only divided into two piles. It only divided into the pile that was either up or down. So you, again, measured something and determined the space quantization, the axis. What if the whole machine had been sideways? Again, it would have divided into two piles because each electron would have been asked the question, are you up or are you down? And it would have said, I'm up. It wouldn't have said, well, it depends on what orientation you mean. It would have just answered the question, I'm up. Now, if the thing was sideways, it would have said, are you east or are you west? It would have said, oh, I'm west. It wouldn't have said, look, I just answered you that I was up. Now, how can I be up and west? It's whatever question you ask it, it would give one of two answers. That way or that way. How could it possibly know in this collection what question you were going to ask? But again, we see like the photon that lands on your retina. By making the measurement, you determine the state. Before you made the measurement, it wasn't up or down. It wasn't in any direction until you asked, or until you put your eye there. You made it up or down. The apparatus made it up or down. It wasn't like that before. Otherwise, you would have gotten this distribution. And as you see from the postcard, you only get two piles with the magnets on, not a whole big blur. The middle part is blank. Nobody was undecided. That's what all the excitement was about. Let's think about the implications of that for a second. Let's do the following experiment. Let's take a helium balloon, and we take the helium atom that lives uh, as an individual atom, and the individual helium atom has two electrons. And, yeah, and, and, and uh, you probably remember from chemistry that this shell is full. This is an inert gas. It's non-reactive. And the reason that it's full is because the two electrons are oriented with this angular momentum that they've got oppositely. One's up and one's down. It doesn't matter what up and down is now. But let's say you did the following experiment. You took those two electrons and you separated them a long distance away from each other. Really a long distance. Uh, the, the diameter of the galaxy. And you separated them and let them go for as long as it took to separate out like that. And you know that they started off in a helium atom, and one was up and one was down, whatever orientation that was up. And then you took one of these stern gerlach machines that measures the answer, and you measured this one. And you said, what direction are you? And it says, ah, I'm up. Well, these two have to be anti-correlated. So this one would all of a sudden become down. When I say all of a sudden, I mean it would instantaneously become down on the other side of the galaxy. I measured this one, and this one had to be the opposite. Now, this sounds like the correlations that you would discover all the time. I reach in my pocket. I don't have my keys. I left them in my office. I didn't, I mean, they didn't just suddenly appear in my office. They were in my office the whole time. I just didn't know until I reached in my pocket and found out that they weren't here. I didn't, I didn't like, send them to my office through the act of reaching into my pocket. Okay. But this is different. This is different. Because I asked a specific question. Had I asked, are you east or west? It would have answered. It would have said, I'm west. And then this one would have been east. No matter what question you ask, you'd get an answer. And this one would suddenly know that it was the opposite. Instantaneously, faster than the speed of light, across the galaxy. Sounds like bullshit, doesn't it? <laughs> okay, well, I have to say, this is where Einstein checked out. <laughs> so here's a picture of Albert Einstein relatively late in life. This was a picture of him in 1935, the year that his most 
cited paper was written. Not the one about relativity, not the one about the photoelectric effect for which he won the Nobel Prize, not the one about Brownian motion or even general relativity. This paper, when he was relatively late in his career, is his most cited work. And the paper says the following. It has this title, which is a little bit maybe grammatically challenged. Can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? That was the name of the paper. And what he concludes, even at the beginning of the abstract, was one is thus led to conclude that the description of reality as given by the wave function is not complete. What he meant by not complete was, sure, all this mumbo jumbo about measuring that one and it correlates with that one does give you the right answers to questions. If you ask the question, that's what will happen in the experiment. Sure, that's what happens in the experiment. But that can't really be what's going on. I'm really, really going on. Now what's interesting is that the same year, Niels Bohr wrote a paper with the same title. <laughs> Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality be Considered Complete by Niels Bohr, single author, in response to the paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Those were the three authors of the previous paper. And it was his response. Isn't that a nice trick? You want to respond to a paper, you give it the same title <laughs> as the paper that you're objecting to. Again, a nice note for the scientists in the crowd. When you have a paper and it's written by authors and you totally disagree with it, write your response, call it the same thing. It's brilliant. But what Bohr said to Einstein and co-workers in response to this can't be the story is, in fact, this new feature of natural philosophy means a radical revision of our attitude as regard to physical reality. Meaning, everything we thought before about things having a reality that's independent from the observation of that reality. That things which are distant from each other being a-causally linked, meaning you measure one and you determine the other, even outside the bounds of special relativity and the speed of light. We have to revise our entire philosophy of life in order to reconcile it with these ideas, if we are to take the experimental results seriously. The alternative is to say, we don't believe what we're measuring. We have no other choice. Now, it could have been that when we did these experiments, we got something else. We do this one, we measure the correlation, we do the correlation. And those experiments took a long time. It wasn't 1935 or the year after that those experiments were finally done. Those experiments took another 30 or 40 years before people started building big machines in which they would launch particles and measure these polarizations and see that these correlations were exactly what quantum mechanics said. And then there was no choice. Simply, Bohr was right. Einstein was wrong. There's no question about it. The experiments have been done. That train has left the station. We can't go back now. We can't go back to a world in which things have an independent reality besides what we observe. We can't go back to a world in which two things at the opposite end of the galaxy are uncorrelated, or two people are uncorrelated, or our relationship with the cosmos are uncorrelated. The connections are deep, the connections are real, and the connections are verified by experimental physics. There's no going back. Imagine, imagine somebody is found in the wilds of uh, the Amazon, practicing voodoo, and they're brought back to a very precise clinical laboratory environment and voodoo is tested. They stick a pin in over here and over there someone says, ouch. And they test it. And it's true. What would you do with it? I mean, you say, oh, that's great. Now I can, you know, I can hurt 
somebody <laughs> far away. But you should be more imaginative than that. You should be thinking, oh, if everything I ever believed about the way the universe works is different than I thought it was, I gotta be able to do something with that. Actually, I didn't know what I would, I couldn't think of anything, actually. So I thought, well, there are people who believe in voodoo. And so what do they do? So I went to the internet, and I saw, if you buy voodoo dolls, what, uh, you know, what can you do with them? And so here they are. You can get a luck voodoo doll. That's good. You can get a money voodoo doll. You can get a love voodoo doll. Or you can get an all-purpose voodoo doll. And the crazy thing is, it costs the same. I don't know why anybody, anybody wouldn't just get the all-purpose voodoo doll. You can you know, find yourself. You can even see that there are people who wrote in from Alexandria, Louisiana, about how well they work, and it was fantastic. <laughs> they got the whole purpose. <laughs> and uh, you know, so th I, I really believe. I mean, I'm serious that this is the kind of level of of of, of new reality we're facing. Once we understand the implications of the experiments, what, what else in our life is different now? What else can we do differently? And I'll give you one tiny example from my field of research, which seems like a very, you know, arcane, not so interesting little bit of mathematics and physics. And it starts with a little, you know, a very tiny bit of audience participation, which is, which is trying to find two prime numbers that multiply together to give you a product. So here's an, an audience uh, participation one. We need two prime numbers. A prime number is a number which is only divisible by one in itself. Let, so we got two answers here. Three and five were the two answers that were given. And that is correct. Those are the two prime numbers that multiply together. They're both prime. You can't divide either one by something except for one in itself. Uh, and uh, it gives you 15. Okay, we're all warmed up now. Next one. <laughs> okay, it's true, it's a little bit harder. <laughs> that's right, one, one, and that's, that's wrong. That's wrong. Because 4633 is not a prime number. I want the two prime roots. Okay, let me say something that's interesting, and I think that you're all kind of thinking it, which is, I have no clue. I mean, I don't even, I don't even think we ever learned that. I don't know what to do on the paper to even begin to figure that out. I mean, if we go hard multiplication problem, we'd say, I don't want to do it. I'm relaxed, it's evening. I mean, I could do it if I wanted to, but I don't want to. Right? This is different. This is like... If I said, I'm going to give you a thousand kroner right now to, to give the answer, you still wouldn't know what to do. And you can imagine it getting harder and harder and harder, and you, still, you wouldn't know what to do. And what's interesting about this problem is that computers also find this problem hard to do. I'll give you the answer. It's 41 times 113. Okay. You knew it, yeah. It's always like that right after you quit. Um, the interesting thing is, is that computers, even the fastest computers, once the numbers get pretty big, have a terrible time with this problem. And what's funny about it is, it's like a one-way key. Like if you give two gigantic prime numbers to a computer, and you say multiply them together, it's just like you, you'd know what to do. I mean, it'd be a pain in the neck, but you could do it. And a computer could do it really fast and would find the answer. Now you say to the computer, okay, Great, that was a nice performance. Now here's this other thing, which is there are two numbers that have been multiplied together that give you this giant number. Find those two numbers. Can't do it. Can't do it. So in fact, if I say the, the length of the number that's been multiplied together could be a you know, 100 bit number or a 1000 bit number, and I take 1000 computers Running not you know to here this was done in the you know the clock speed of a 2003 computer or the clock speed of a 2018 computer you know, the fastest computer even projected into the future 
using the best known algorithm available to find the two prime factors, this is how long it would take. Okay, so even a number of a couple of thousand bits long, it would take the best known algorithm, the age of the universe, to solve the problem. So that's what you call a difficult problem. <laughs> now, what's, what's less known is that that's why you can type your credit card into the internet and buy a book or something and not have other people be able to decrypt it once it's been encrypted. Because on your end and on the other end, somewhere, there are two prime numbers that are being multiplied together, and there's no computer that can figure out how to break them apart. So you have a key, and Amazon has a key, and they're put together, and no eavesdropper who's trying to break the number apart can figure out how to break them apart. So all of internet security relies on the fact that there's no solution to that problem that anybody knows how to do. Now, there may be a solution, but nobody's found it yet. Nobody's found a way to do this problem quickly. And so, for now, it's okay to use internet commerce and these ones that are HTTPS, when it has a little S on it, it means secure. Now you say, oh, I know the NSA can, can you know, <laughs> decode these things. Well, I can tell you they can't, because there is no known algorithm for doing this, not even at the NSA. On the other hand, if you had a quantum computer, I think I might have even left this, this off the graph, I'm sorry about that, sorry. Um, if you had a quantum computer that could take all of these things at the same time, then all of this stuff becomes very easy to do and you could probably, I, I, the, the curve disappeared off of here, I'm sorry, but a 2,000 bit number comes in at about one day using this algorithm. So now, going back to the very first view graph about why is the CIA interested in this quantum computer, this is the answer. They want to know a couple of things at the CIA. First of all, they'd like to know how to make one of these machines. They'd also like to know something else, which is, I think, more interesting, which is what kind of encryption can't a quantum computer break? What kind of encryption is safe from even the cat being alive and dead at the same time? The answer to that question is it's not known. The class of problems which can be solved by a quantum computer or the class of problems which are Quantum resistant, they call it. That is, you can't, you can't do anything, even if you had a quantum computer. That's a better way to, to protect information. So there's all of this deep connection between what happened 100 years ago in Copenhagen, where all of these deep mysteries of how the world works, and then someone asked the question, yeah, it's strange, but is it good for anything? And this is one answer to the question of what's it good for. It would be very interesting if you could make a machine that could do things that other machines can't do. But maybe even more profound than that would be to ask the question, what class of phenomena are possible in quantum mechanics that human beings have never seen before because the machines have never existed? There are many examples of things that if there wasn't a human maker, or a maker on another planet with high intelligence wouldn't exist. And this may be one of them. We don't know what this would do because we've never found one sitting around to play with. And the accident, like the one that happened in 1927 with the nickel, hasn't happened. So we just keep playing. So I make these chips. We cool them down to low temperature in a laboratory near absolute zero. This is a picture of the inside of the laboratory. And we do experiments where we try to use semiconductors to do the kinds of experiments that I was talking about before. Here's the beginning one, the one that I talked about where you make the correlation. But instead of now sending it to the opposite sides of the galaxy, let's just do it all on one chip. So I make the two electrons. They have opposite spin. I change the voltages, and they separate into two piles. And I ask questions like, 
Can I measure this one and determine the state of that one? Can I begin to do these experiments with real electrons in a chip? It sounds like it's going to take a long time. And maybe it will. Maybe it won't be in my lifetime or in our, any of our lifetimes when any of this stuff happens. But it's such an interesting question to find out whether or not these correlations that are so impossible to believe can be something or do something that has never happened before. So I've been talking for, I guess, nearly an hour now about this idea of making a chip. And I've been trying to convince you that all of this stuff is within the laws of physics and we just haven't done it yet. But there's a, there's a kind of a mystery beneath this mystery that I maybe want to touch on just at the end. Which is, when do you say something's impossible versus when do you say it's just hard? Are any of us arrogant enough to say that's impossible? I, I was racking my brain for the kind of thing that a scientist would generally say. You know, just really trying to find an example. That's impossible. So here, I, I, I picked one that you can read with me from Wikipedia. This is about homeopathic medicine. <laughs> and this is the kind of thing, you know, it's very controversial. There's, there's, there's people on, on both sides of the fence. I'll tell you, I happen to not be a believer in the efficacy of homeopathic medicine. But I'm not as strident as Wikipedia. If you read what Wikipedia has to say about it, they say the following about homeopathic medicine. Depending on the dilution, homeopathic remedies may not contain any pharmacologically active molecules. And for such remedies to have pharmacological effect would violate fundamental principles of science. Modern homeopaths have proposed that water has a memory that allows homeopathic preparations to work without any of the original substance. However, there are no verified observations nor scientifically plausible physical mechanisms for such a phenomenon. The lack of convincing scientific evidence supporting homeopathy's efficacy and its use of remedies lacking effective ingredients have caused home homeopathy to be described as pseudoscience, quackery, and a, quote, cruel deception. So in a word, it's pretty clear where these folks come down, that this is the, the essence of impossible. This is different than trying to build a quantum computer, which is just damn hard. <laughs> But it's interesting if you look a little farther at water. Because actually, little known, there are two kinds of water. And it involves what Stern and Gerlach discovered. It involves the angular momentum, the spin. You can make an alphabet out of water, and you can encode information in water. Here are the two different kinds of water. The protons that make up Mickey Mouse's ears in the water molecule carry angular momentum. And those two angular momenta, just like the spins that I separate to the sides of the galaxies, can either be oriented in the opposite direction, or they can be oriented in the same direction. And these two molecules have ever so slightly different energies because of the magnetic interaction associated with these angular momentum. So there's like water type 1 and water type 2. And what's interesting about it is, if I read the abstract of this paper, now we're up to 2009. Spin degree of freedom, and that's called a spin, the angular momentum. The spin degree of freedom of water molecules in gas and liquid state were investigated in order to provide a reasonable answer about the unsolved problem of long-term behavior of water spin isomers. Isomers are the two different kinds. Uh, the approach used involved an assumption of molecules, blah, 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 blah. To date, three experiments are known that demonstrated long-term behavior of ortho water and para water in liquid state for about, uh, the long-term behavior for about one hour and about one week. If, uh, let's see. To date, three experiments are known that demonstrate the long-term behavior of ortho water and para water in liquid state for about one hour and about one week if water molecules are dissolved in glycerin. That is, when you orient them in this way or this way, they last that way for a week. Now that's interesting. That says homeopathy is not impossible. Maybe just it only lasts a week. Well, that's a totally different story. 
that's, that's in some other realm. So all this story about there is no scientifically plausible evidence, well, there are two kinds of water. So you could ask the question, what would water be like if you encoded information in the water? It's too hard of a question to ask, would it cure disease? Science has no idea whether it would cure disease. I'm even asking fundamental questions like, what would its viscosity be? What would its color be? And the problem with answering that question is that now from a paper of a couple of months ago is the question of let's try to study water. But the problem is in order to study water, you need a quantum computer. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> of the same time. There is no such thing as the same time. Simultaneity, as of 1905, is a myth. Okay? So, you know, so you don't even have any ground to stand on anymore these days. Nothing that we take to be sacred. Simultaneity, you know, symmetry under parity reversal, all of these things which just seem so totally obvious. So maybe a more serious answer would be that the process of observation does something to the state which makes it answer the question, which of the possibilities that were previously described by the wave function is reality? And you could ask me, what happened to all the other possibilities? Where did they go? Can someone else see the other possibility? It seems that the answer is no. It seems that once the probability becomes reality, it's game over. And it becomes that spot, which is what you saw. Once it hits the screen, then the possibility of it being elsewhere suddenly vanishes, instantaneously vanishes from all the other possibilities. So the other observer, if the first one saw it first, and remember I'm rejecting the idea of simultaneity, if the other one saw it first, wouldn't get a chance. I that helps. <laughs> yeah? What process exactly constitutes an observation? It's a philosophical question that have a variety. Yes, yeah, sorry! <laughs> the answer to the question is, what precisely constitutes a observation? And I will give you my answer. Well, that's kind of actually already part of the answer. I mean, that like other people will disagree, okay? I did something, okay, which is this, which is this, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty precise answer. I described a process in which, for instance, the thing went to the left and the switch was up, and the thing went to the right and the switch was down. So that a correlation evolved in which left up and right down were correlated with each other. Then that switch touches something else, and it would become like um, left, up, light on. And then left, up, light on, wall hot. Then left, up, wall on, light, hot, 
uh, you know, I don't know, bird flies away, whatever the, you know, whatever the thing is. And then that process happens extremely fast, picoseconds, nanoseconds, in which one state mixes quickly and runs through the whole universe of one possibility. So that the correlation of one outcome with all kinds of possibilities becomes correlated. When it's only one or two correlations, like left, up, it has a name in physics called entanglement. And you say that those two states are entanglement. And so what I would say is it's runaway entanglement. The observation process is in which, is one in which a, a state becomes entangled with everything. It does not answer the question of what happened to the other side. You can say it's in another universe somewhere. And that's the best you can do. But the process of going from possibility to one particular reality, the measurement process, is one in which the screen and my eye and my brain and everything else, and it doesn't need to be a human being or anything thinking, it just has to be that it becomes correlated with a bunch of other physical states. That process is decoherence. And that process is the measurement. As far as I understand it. Do you need a conscious observer? Do you need a consciousness to make an observation? I, I can't accept that. There's I'm sorry, but you have to accept it because you're completely wrong. <laughs> Get in the way! Wait, 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 do you, would you like the headphone? Wait, can we make a deal? Yes! I want, yes. Yeah, well, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. I give him the microphone and three minutes. I have the voice. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Three microphone in three minutes? Okay. All right. Okay, you have to speak. There's a law of eternal recurrence. That's how it operates. Wait, we missed the first part. Sorry, sorry again. Right? You're interrupting. No, sorry. You live in a computer. Simulated reality. Yes. There are two laws. The law of eternal recurrence is the first thing. It keeps on running. Everything is on this recurrent function. You see the running process. The second law is the law of attraction, of information, which is how it builds up the database. There are four parts in this database. You see them as particles in the reality that you observe. You have the proton, you have the neutron, which, by the way, is broken. And then you see electrons and positrons. Why can't you observe electrons? Because that's the runtime, guys. You are seeing the running computer, and only one of them is working. So only when they work together, you get a photon, and you get light. That's the thing. That's why you can only observe positrons very, very seldomly. You are looking at the runtime, and it's never in the same place. If you look at a piece of code being executed, one, 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 zero, one, whatever, you don't know where it is. You're going to see something different all the time. But it's just three particles. It's collecting. All of history is a tree running. All you read in the Abrahamic religion and in all religions is actually true, if you look at it, from the point of view of trees of execution. That's all it is. You have a fate, just like you're being told, because you're being run by the computer program. In your left, in your left brain, you are having all the programming. In the right brain, you are having all the programming in both of them from different computers. Your pineal gland is the middle. This is the same shape as the atom that I told you about. You see? You have the neutron. That is dead because it's broken. And you have the proton, which is still working and is controlling all of your life. The whole language that you see around you is a construct. This program was built to disassemble the matrix so you can see it with your own eyes. Okay.
it brings up is not unlike this parallel universes comment that I made, and not unlike the comment about the difference between impossible and difficult, which is that science is governed by experiment. So, I would challenge the previous speaker to say, help me decide whether what you've said is true or not by telling me what I can measure that would show that it's not true. That's the key piece of logic in experimental science. No, no, but wait, careful, 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 careful. It has to be an experiment. This is fundamental. It has to be an experiment that shows that you're wrong. That's a key idea. You can't prove an idea with an experiment. You can only show that an idea is wrong. So the burden is the burden is to find experiments which refute ideas. We are in the refutation business. We are not in the proof business. All of the ideas that I've said to you today and all of the ideas of this gentleman are provisional. They are provisional until something else comes along that refutes the idea. The engine of scientific progress is showing that things are wrong, not that they're right. Can we take more, Martin, or have we got to get out of here? Okay, one more. I have a question. Okay, thank you. It was great. I have one. I have one question. The question it was a long. It was a long one. I'm going to try. It was: Are you saying? Since there's only one photon, let's say I turned the amplitude down so low that the photons went one at a time. Really, like you know, the time between photons was longer than the time that. It, took to get to the screen. So I go uh, one out, bonk. Next one out, bonk. I really spaced them one at a time. The question was, where's the other photon? There was only one photon. Are you saying, he said, that that photon is interacting with itself or some like ghost of itself that went some other way? And the answer is yes. The answer is yes. And if I gave it three choices, I'd have to take all three into account. And if I gave it all of space, I'd have to describe all of space as the possibilities of where it could have gone. It's only a discrete number because I set up the problem in a simple way with a discrete number of choices. But in fact, the space of options in real space is a continuum. It's all places at the same time until it's measured, as far as I understand. All right. I have a question. Okay, so I have one last question. Final.